Good morning. It is my very distinct privilege this morning to introduce to you Kyle Isabelli. He's the pastor of Avenue Christian Church, which is just around the corner from here. He's a friend of mine, and long story short, he's going to be preaching this morning. So I'm just going to do this little intro for him, and then he's going to come and share God's Word, continuing our series, Beginnings. He's going to be talking about Abraham. We talked about it last week. We're not going to cover... We, we talked about... Um, the fact that I talked about Abraham last week, we're not going to overlap. There's plenty that, that we can preach on Abraham. Very excited to hear his message, and I really believe that, that he's going to have a good word for us. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never failed me. All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and darkest nights. You are close like no other. Sales Community Church. My name is Kyle Isabelli, and I'm the senior pastor at Avenue Christian Church in Clarendon Hills, right down the road from you. Now, I want to take this opportunity to thank Pastor Paul for allowing me to share with you this morning. And 
Even more, I want you to know how much of an influence and impact Paul has had on me since I became the senior pastor at Avenue in January of 2020. For these past two years, Paul has been a faithful mentor and a friend to me on a consistent basis. He has cared for and he's prayed for me and my family through the ups and downs that life has had us on, and he's given me great wisdom in leading the church throughout this pandemic season. In fact, he affectionately gave me the nickname Pandemic Pastor since I have only known what it's like to be a senior pastor in the midst of a global pandemic. Paul's faithfulness to me has been a a tremendous blessing, and it's been a clear representation of God's faithfulness to us all. And so as as we continue this morning in the sermon series that you guys have been going through called Beginnings, as we go through the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, we're going to take some time this morning to look and see God's faithfulness on display. So the title of this message is Faithful When We Fail, and we'll be looking at the story of Abraham's interaction with God in Genesis chapter 15. A few of the sermons Paul has already preached in this series have a similar idea of seeing God's faithfulness even when we as humans fail. So just so we are all on the same page, when we say God is faithful, it means that he's never failed to keep any of his promises. He never has and he never will. And he will always come through to deliver on his promises. He always has and he always will. We can clearly see this in one of the first promises God makes to Abraham, the father of the Israelites, the Jewish people, the people of God. And we will also see clearly that when Abraham fails or falls short, God still keeps his promises to him. And ultimately, he keeps his promises to us today. So Genesis chapter 15 verses 1 through 6 captures God at this point talking to Abram, not Abraham just yet. And he's giving Abraham a recap of these promises that he talked about in Genesis chapter 12. He'll make him a great nation. He'll bless him with his own biological son. He'll have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. Yet Abraham continues to ask God more questions about the stipulations of these promises, specifically about inheriting the land that God has promised him, so that he's got room for all of these descendants. Now, he hasn't seen the reality of these promises just yet. I think we can all relate. You know, my wife Maria and I have two kids, Nora, who's in first grade, and Max, who's in preschool. Sunday afternoons at the Isabelli house are our time when we get to watch a movie as a family. So we get home from church, we eat lunch, give the kids some time to play while Maria and I clean up the kitchen, we catch up about the morning. And within five minutes, one, if not both of our kids come into the kitchen and ask, hey, can we watch a movie? Is it time to watch a movie yet? When are we going to watch a movie? Now, we've been in this rhythm for quite some time. And never once have we not come through on our promise to them that we're going to watch a movie in the afternoon. Yet every week, they come in asking, wondering, doubting. (laughs) This seems trivial, but I think we've all done this with God in some way and sometimes continue to do this with Him. Yet we can all relate to Abram in this moment, verses 1 through 6, and how he's questioning. Yet look how God responds in verse 7 and following. It, It says this, Abram also said to, or God said to them, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? In verse 9, so the Lord said to him, Bring me a, a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. So Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. So Abram wants to be sure that God will really give him all the land. So God sets up a contract, a covenant, a legal promise. Now this was very common practice within the ancient Near Eastern culture. Two people in this culture were going to make a treaty or deal over a piece of land because of land that was gained during a war or land gained from an arranged marriage. They would each set up a sacrifice and then both people would walk through the middle of these sacrifices. Now, after they walked through the middle of them, they would burn the animals that they'd sacrificed, signifying that the deal was complete. What this also signified is that if one person broke this land agreement, then they would suffer the same fate as the animals whose blood had been slain and had been set on fire. They would deserve death. I mean, this was serious what was happening here between God and Abraham. God was serious, and Abram was ready to see God follow through on his promise to him. 
especially because it had been 10 years since God made the promise to him in Genesis chapter 12. But look what happens here next in verse 11. It says this, Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. So Abram sets all of this up, and he didn't do it instantly. Like, it took him some time to kill the animals, separate the animals in each side. But after all of it, God doesn't show up right away. The animals start to decay a little. The vultures come down to get themselves some meat. Like I said before, I think we can all relate to Abram in this way. Like we're obedient, we're faithful, we're doing the best that we can to follow God, but he's not answering that prayer. He's not blessing us just a little bit. He's not providing the comfort and peace that we need to get through whatever it is that we're going through. Like, God, we've done what you've asked us to do. Now, where are you? This is how Abram feels. But look at how God then responds here in verse 12 and following. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him in a dream, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. Verse 16. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared, and passed between the pieces. Now on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. Now wait a second. Did you catch that last part? This covenant is supposed to have both of the parties walk through together. Yeah, Abram's put in this deep sleep by God, and then this fire pot torch thing (laughs) walks through the middle of the animals, and it burns the animals up, and it's signifying that the covenant has been made. But because of what we see here in verse 18, we can assume that this was God and His Spirit who was behind this whole fire pot torch thing. Not sure how He did it, but we do know that a cloud of smoke by day and a cloud of fire by night is what symbolized the presence of God to the Israelites when they escaped Egypt and were led in the wilderness by God. However, this goes directly against what was normal in that culture because only one person went through it. Not Abram, only the fire pot. <laughs> So the implications of this allow us to fully understand the promise God made with Abram. And it helps us to understand the faithfulness of God. You see, God made this covenant official. He took full responsibility that if it's broken in any way, his blood alone would be shed. And that's exactly what God does. He gives Abram the land to the people of Israel within the fourth generation of his descendants, as it says here in verse 16. He's talking about Joseph who goes through all the hardships to be put in charge and to allow Israel to be at peace for quite some time. Then when the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites for 400 years, as it says here in the text, God then sets them free and once again gives them the land that we see throughout the Old Testament storyline, the lives of Joshua, the judges during the early kingdom reigns of King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and the blessings of all nations. Well, God fulfills that in his son, Jesus. That anyone and everyone who trusts in Jesus, the, the Jewish carpenter, the Savior, both Jews and Gentiles, will be blessed and restored to a right relationship with God the Father forever. See, God comes through in all of these promises. He's faithful over and over again. Yet throughout Israel's history, any person, any leader, they break the covenant. They don't hold up their side of walking faithfully and obedient before the Lord. They fail miserably. They don't follow through. And I know I can put myself in that equation, and I bet you you can too. We, we fail miser- miserably. We f- fall short at following God's ways perfectly. So in this covenant agreement with Abram, even though the people broke the promise, God was the one who was held accountable for it. His blood was shed because he's the only one who walked through the middle. And that's what he did. He sent his son Jesus, who lived a perfect life, to die on the cross for our sins. And even though he didn't break the covenant or the promise, He took it on himself to make sure that the punishment was taken so that a new covenant promise could still be enjoyed. You see, Jesus fulfills the requirements of the old covenant, which is death. So then the new covenant is something that builds upon the old covenant that God made with Abram and the people of Israel. 
It's something that Jesus and Jesus alone is able to fulfill because he suffered the consequences of us breaking the first covenant. Hebrews chapter 7 verses 23 to 25 tell us about how Jesus as a priest offers his life as a sacrifice to God. It says this, Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests before, since death prevented them from continuing in office. But Jesus lives forever. He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can have full confidence that no matter what we feel, what we experience, what we go through, God will be faithful. God's faithful when we fail. God will never break his promise to us even when we, he feels distant, even when we are waiting on him, even when we lose trust or hope in him, even when we want nothing to do with him. And I know sometimes this can be hard to fully grasp and believe. You know, I was convicted with this reality a few months ago when one of the elders at our church was leading our church and celebrating communion. You know, he had just gotten through about a month of him and his family all being sick with COVID and just being at home, not really feeling great at all. And then he heard this phrase on the radio, something along these lines. He said this, we are so quick to trust God for our eternity, but we are quick to lose trust in God for our days. You know, that really stuck with me. I think I have, and maybe you have. We have full confidence in what Jesus did for us, what God has done from us from the beginning, things we never saw with our eyes, but we know in our hearts and minds to be fully true. Yet when we go through difficult seasons of life now, we doubt, we question, we get mad, we lose trust. Now, now hear me out. I think there's a healthy amount of questioning and doubt that does need to be a part of our faith, a wrestling with God that He consistently invites us into as we grow in our relationship with Him so that we can grow in our trust in Him. But I know that I've been guilty of doubting and then giving myself permission to disobey, to just push God away, to Treat others poorly because I'm in a bad mood because of what God is doing or what He hasn't done yet. I know you can probably relate. And when we do this, we not only hurt our relationship with God, but we also hurt our relationship with others. And yet He remains faithful. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't throw in the towel on us when we throw in the towel on Him. And so as we close our time together, I think there are two ways that we can apply what we've learned today from His Word into our lives. First, I think we have to confess our failures. We can tell God where we've fallen short, where we've disobeyed and have justified our actions because, well, we feel like he's forgotten us. You know, I can do or say what I want because it seems like you don't care and you're not in control and you're not protecting me from hardships. And the list can go on and on. And yet we can be reminded that he is faithful to forgive us if we confess our sins and he will give us his spirit, his Holy Spirit as a guarantee that we're forgiven. And that we're restored to right relationship with him right now and forevermore. And after we confess our failures to him, we can then trust in his faithfulness. No matter what season you find yourself in, no matter what hardship, broken relationship, difficult situation you have to face, you can believe that God has not forgotten you. Trust that he'll be with you and that he'll give you wisdom and strength to endure and grow and become more like Jesus. Be reminded of the promise that Jesus, his brother James, gives to us in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. It says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. God's willing and ready to give you and I wisdom in whatever we're facing, to help us become more like Christ and grow in our faith in Him, no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. So consider it a great opportunity to see once again that God is faithful when we fail, that He's working all things for our good and His glory. And so let's make a commitment today and this week to confess and to trust in Him. And if we fail, let's remind ourselves of how time and time again, he's going to keep his promises. He never fails. And may that empower and encourage us to be faithful to him once again. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you have fulfilled the covenant 
and given us a new covenant that allows us to fully trust and obey you. Would you help us to see in Abram's life the same story in our lives today, that even when we fail, you are faithful. Lord, would you encourage us today? Would your Holy Spirit guide us to confess what we need to confess and to take a step forward in trusting you in our lives with how we live? We love you so much, Jesus, and thank you for this time together this morning. We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kyle. So glad you could be with us. So glad that all of you could join us today. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.